And here we have it, the man of the hour, a good actor, a great sports fan, a great father, a great husband, and most of all, just a great human being. Please welcome soprano star, Joe Ganascoli. I hope I said that right. You got it right, Eddie. How are you? <laughs> What's happening, my man? Uh, not much. Joe, when keep you were, trying to keep busy. Uh, I don't blame you. When you were a kid, growing up in Brooklyn, did you play sports? Yeah. Were you an athlete? I played hockey and baseball. Hockey and baseball? Yeah. And what inspired you to play hockey? Uh, I just love the game. Love the game of base, uh, hockey, and uh, I love baseball. I didn't play football. Didn't like basketball. Those are my two sports. Favorite baseball player that you really loved, that you really idolized? Bobby Bobby Mercer. Really? Yeah. And why him? He was my Mickey Mantle. I was uh, too young for Mickey Mantle. Same scout, same city, center fielder, home run hitter. Not as great as the Mick, but that was my uh, that was my guy. You know, he was so close to close with Thurman Munson. You know that, right? Oh, of course. I cried as a kid when I, when they got traded. Went to the Cubs. Uh, he was in the uh, yeah. Then we got him back. In 1979, he got that game-winning hit on Thurman Munson. Uh, his death two days later, right? Did That's you correct. That game? Yep, that was I know exactly where I was when he died. Where were you? I was working in my friend's store he had a meat market. And a guy thought a guy was breaking my balls, told me he passed away. Oh. And I had to call sports phone to find out. <laughs> sports phone. So you went to Lafayette High School. Right. You know, there's some big names that went to that school. You realize that. Did you go with any of those guys? Uh, Johnny Franco was a year, year, uh, year younger than me, but you know, the Will Pond, Sandy Koufax, Pete Falcone, um, Julian Schnabel, the director went there. I'm sure there's some others, but, uh, Lafayette was great. Well, also the boxing, uh, the ring, the ring guy, what's his name? Larry Merchant, the boxing announcer. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He went there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, Larry King, he went there. He went to, he went to Lafayette, Larry yeah, King? Yeah, Larry Or Erasmus? No, no, no. He went he... to Lafayette. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you went to a legendary school, man. Not only good athletes, but a lot of great artists came out of that place. Wow, well, I know. I know. So when your yeah, parents, very proud. When, you, when your parents told you, stay away from that corner, what does that mean? Uh, there was a lot of wise guys where I grew up. And, uh, yeah, no, I never. Shit. Uh, but I was uh, paddle ball and uh, softball. Uh, yeah, no, wise guy life wasn't for me. Yeah, I just lost you a little bit. So when, they, when your parents told you to stay away from that corner, they told that was a lot of wise guys hanging out there. Yeah, a lot, a lot of Avenue was. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of wise guys, a lot of wise guys. Um, but I didn't go that way. I, I was never, you know, tempted. I never uh, wasn't for me. I wanted to be a ball player, so I hung out in the park. Oh, would you play stickball? No, nah, we played stickball on the block. We played softball. Paddle ball. Uh, I didn't play basketball there, but uh, that was the spot. So after high school, you went to St. John's. What happened then? Yeah, yeah, I didn't last too long in St. John's. School wasn't for me. I lasted maybe about a year, year and a half. And uh, I went to go work in Lord and Taylor. Uh, doing security under under undercover security, 
And um, then uh, uh, you catch anybody? Yeah, I did actually. One or two guys. One time they they just uh, they they dropped. It was like a a, a grab and run. Mm -hmm. They dropped everything and they and it was a big kid, black kid. I said, "Yo, take it, man. I'm not getting, I'm not dealing with this. Forget it." And yeah, when you are so so, what happened? Like okay, so after college, right? Because we're turning back the clock. We want to know your journey after college. You gave up. Then what? I worked in Lord and Taylor. Uh huh. And I spoke to the executive chef who cooked for the uh, president. Mm -hmm. And she got me a job in uh, a restaurant in Manhattan. That was my first restaurant job. And uh, I started doing prep. And uh, went to another restaurant. And then I had an opportunity. I moved to New Orleans when I was like 21. So and I stayed there for four years. A New Yorker going to New Orleans, like how'd just you like that. Twenty-one years old, not knowing nobody. You just, pay, but what made you go there? You, you saw an opportunity. Yeah, well, early '80s, New Orleans food was like the rage. You know, Paul Prudhomme, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was uh, blackened fish, and early '80s. That's what everybody was into. So it was a good opportunity, and that was it. So cooking skills, self-taught, right? You didn't go to one of those chef schools like CIA. You just <laughs> fell in love with cooking. Yeah, I um, and I come from a big cooking family. It wasn't like big family meals. It's just something I liked. It was being creative, and uh, uh, I sort of fell into it, and... You know, I learned a lot in uh, New Orleans at the time. It's a great experience. And, uh, you know, 21 years old, you're on your own. It's it's not easy. Joe, well, you like a superstar in New Orleans? Like they see a New Yorker with a heavy Brooklyn accent. They're like, oh, my God. Yeah, you know, they, they, break, they, they break balls, you know, Vinny Tortellini and all that shit. But it, the thing about New Orleans is I, I couldn't get used to it. Everything moves so slow. And I figured out once summer came, the humidity was terrible. And it was like 100 degrees. As soon as you got out of the shower, you started sweating. It was terrible. So I could understand why everybody used to move slow. But I'm glad I did it. So after New Orleans, so at 25, you come back to uh, New York, right? Uh, came back to New York when I was uh, 24. 24, yeah, 24, 25, and I got a job in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and after a few months, I was the chef. I had maybe six months, I was the chef, mm -hmm. and I was 24 years old. I was the chef of this uh, multi-million dollar restaurant, which was uh, pretty cool, mm -hmm. and I was there for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and bounced around back to Manhattan working in some places, and then I opened up my own when I was, like, 30. And that, and that restaurant, where, where where was that restaurant on? Bay Ridge, mm -hmm. Brooklyn, 101 it was called. What is and, it? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. It was very popular, and uh, I was making a ton of money, and I was gambling heavily. And uh, one Sunday I lost, and this is 1990, I lost $60,000 one Sunday, which was astronomical. And I had to cash out my end of the, uh, the restaurant, paid off my bookie and moved to L.A. to uh, pursue acting. What, within how many days did the, did the guy say, hey, give me that money? I mean, you had to sell the restaurant. And I lost Sunday, and by Thursday I was in L.A. So you had to pay them, and then you left to L.A.? Paid them. Had to get someone to watch, you know, stay in my apartment. I didn't want to lose that. And, yeah, that was it. What's the biggest uh, – was that the biggest gamble you ever had that you lost, 60000 Oh, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it was three games. <laughs> <laughs> but what about any big wins? Did you ever win big? Uh, 5,000 here. I was like up and down, up and down. You know, it was the last game of the year, and I wanted to send it in. So I think I bet 10, and I was down. Then I bet 20. So now I'm down 30, and I doubled up. The bookie says, you're betting 60,000 if you lose. You got this, right? I said, of course I got it. And uh, I lost. Did you ever, like, try to call Warren Moon and tell, tell him, damn, man, you fucked me up? <laughs> well, it's funny you say Warren Moon because uh, it was the Houston Oilers, and the guy who beat me was his backup. That's um, what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cody Carlson, that's it. Cody Carlson was his backup against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yep, and that was it. So yeah, he, so Warren, Warren Moon fucked me. Yeah, but I mean, you rest your starters for the playoffs. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what happened. That bet, man? You were desperate for you wanted to get even. Well, I wanted to get even, but you know everybody's resting their starters, and then uh, I took Pittsburgh, the number one defense, and uh, the Oilers lit them up because you know Pittsburgh didn't care. Right, right. So now you move to L.A. Mm. You don't know anybody there, right? Mm -mm. Who told you to go to uh, to move to L.A.? Were you think well? Well, what happened was, I mean, let me tell you this part. In between um, Nightfalls, which was the restaurant I was chef at, and 101, I worked in Manhattan. I was like 27, 28. And I was working in this restaurant, and a, lawyer, and a, uh, a waiter there uh, had his own theater company, because everybody's an actor. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm doing this play. Do you want to come and audition for it? You'd be good for this role. And I did. And I did this play, and uh, um, after it was all over, I says, you know, what do I do now? He says, you go study with my teacher. So I got out of the restaurant business. I sold ice cream from a cart while I was studying, and I didn't really get much out of studying because it was like this guy was out of his mind, and he taught in a basement on 72nd and Broadway, 73rd and Broadway, an apartment building. And he had about 10, eight students, you know, different classes. And I enjoyed watching this guy teach and listening to him because he was so eccentric. I didn't even really get much about what he was teaching. So after a while, he threw me out of the class. Well, he throws everybody out of the class. <laughs> after a year and a half, I got tired of being selling ice cream, being broke. I got back into the restaurant. So that's how I started really into the acting. And when I lost my restaurant, I called up my friend who got me started. He was living in L.A. And he said, come stay with me. I'm, I'm house sitting in the Hollywood Hills, producer's house. And that's how I started. Uh, so I knew him. And then we bounced around different house sitting. We got an apartment and so on. So that's how I started in L.A. So then tell me the story about <laughs> some guy says he wants to represent you. And you're like, uh, oh. he's, he's like a fraud. You're like, what the fuck? Like, I don't get it. I thought you're an agent. Well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fraud. It was, uh, you know, a young kid just starting out. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't get an agent. And he said, I'm starting my old agency. And he gets, you know, he starts his own agency. And I'm like, uh, all wired up that morning that he's opening. You know, he's operating out of his apartment. And I go there and he's still sleeping. And I go, this is your first day. What, what are you doing sleeping? And you know, I had the breakdowns in my hand because they were in front of his door. And uh, I, uh, you know, started saying, submit me for this, submit me for that. And, you know, all these roles that I was right for. And then I'd say, did you call up? See if the casting director got the uh, you the photo. You're going to give me an audition. And I was driving the guy nuts. So I started taking the breakdowns from him early in the morning, go making copies and submitting myself, and then I would call up as my manager. Uh, my name was James Hoving, and I would say, you got to see this guy, uh, my client, Joe Ganascoli. He was He's a theater actor, and that's how I started to get myself for auditions. <laughs> that's a, but let me ask you this. With the break, but then what about when 
they look at your resume. They're like, well, you don't really have a resume. What'd you do after? Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot her name. Bonnie Timmerman. Bonnie Timmerman. Oh, she's a big. I had nothing on my resume. I just had asked. Yeah, she was. Mm-hmm. I just had the acting teacher, and you know, she turned it over, and she goes, "When did you start acting? Yesterday." So I went home and I made up all these different off Broadway. No way they could find out. You know, little short films, student films. Um, and I puffed up my, uh, beefed up my resume, you know, acting skills, uh, special things I could do, like fucking ride a horse, uh, you know, shit like that. <laughs> so I had all these plays. I had some uh, TV. I had commercials and things you can't check like you could check now. So just so it was something to look at. And that's how I got my first role. And that first role was... Um... What was the name of that film? Uh, Money for Nothing. Yeah, and you it's a had great some, film with. Uh, you had superstars on that film back. Michael then. Madsen, John Cusack. John yeah. Cusack was the lead. John Debbie Mazer, Michael Madsen, Benito Del Toro, Lenny Venito, Michael Rapaport, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Gandolfini was in it too. Yeah, Gandolfini. Yeah. Yeah. So now, tell me about Benicio Del Toro. How'd you guys meet on set? I never met him. I only had one scene. It's usually a day higher that they were going to, uh, but they liked me, so they flew me out to Pittsburgh, which was cool. Mm-hmm. And um, they, uh, I remember calling up Michael Matson. I said, "Hey, listen, uh, you know, I, can I make some changes to my line? Can we meet in the lobby and go over it?" Go, oh, sure. I'll meet you in the lobby. And he was so uh, nice, and. Um, uh, but Benito remembered me and uh, tracked me down. I was working at this uh, deli on uh, Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And uh, he says, you know, I'm doing a short film. I want you for the lead. It's you, Matthew McConaughey, and uh, uh, Valeria Galino. And uh, yeah, that was a, it was a short film. We spent the weekend in a hotel. And uh, that's how many Benito. So then he got me in a couple of other films that the casting directors were uh, um, uh, f- filming, uh, doing movies. They and they said, "Listen, you're in our movies. We don't know who you are. Why don't you come and meet us?" And they said, "Do you have an agent?" I said, "No." They said, "Well, keep in touch. We've always got stuff going on." And that's how the Sopranos came along. So how'd you get involved with, uh, how'd you get in George Jan's and Sheila Jaffe's office? Well, they said, keep in touch. And, uh, and I, you know, they call us every once in a while, see what's happening. And I did. And, um, that's how I got an audition for the Sopranos. And, you know, I, you know, I had one scene as a different character in the first season, a bakery season in Gino. And then I, uh, um, brought me back as Vito. You had that this idea, which I'm a big fan of that book called Murder Machine, right? That's how you created that character? You suggested to... Uh... Yeah, it was Vito. I got to kill Jackie Jr. And during season four, I brought the book to uh, one of the writers. And I said, listen, this is a, I'm reading this book. It's called True Story. One of the guys in the crew, it's a very famous cool Roy DeMail's crew. Um, he was gay and I said it's kind of interesting I would be willing to do it because I wanted to get you know more acting and show I can act so that's what we did I mean listen it's, it's really a tough role to take on but I'm, 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 I'm assuming the reason you suggested that because I guess in The Sopranos the show a lot of people get they get killed off and you know and if you don't have any, you know, once you get killed off, your, your episodes are done. That's it. Now you got to find another job. Right. Get killed off in a lot of different ways. Guys got killed off, like, went for an episode or two or a couple. Um, you know, I had, it was a great storyline that they made a dedicated pretty much a whole season to. Right. And so uh, I was proud of that. You know, it's not easy being from Brooklyn playing a gay guy. Um. Uh, but you know, I was, uh, 
some guys are nervous about their sexuality. You never know, like they're on the fucking fence. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know which way to go. They're like, you know, anti-gay. Me, I mean, listen, I worked in restaurants, so I was used to gays. I was very comfortable with them. I didn't have a problem with them. You know what I mean? You do your thing. Mm -hmm. I do. I worked in a gay restaurant, not only in Los Angeles but in Manhattan. Me and another guy in the kitchen, and the chef were all straight. Mm -hmm. And the waiters used to bring in the girls that used to hang out with the gay guys, they, like after work, where they worked in hair salons or whatever. And they were, I mean, I listen, I was 175 pounds. I was in shape. They used to go, this is Joe and Danny. They're straight. And uh, I mean, it was great. They were bringing us girls all the time to meet. Oh, yeah. No, listen, <laughs> the, the more gay guys, the more women for me. That's how I look at life. So, go ahead. 100%. <laughs> and, and it's true. They, the, the gay dudes, they do have a lot of beautiful women. Lots. Yeah. They're friends with. And girls so. feel comfortable around them. They're not going to get hit on. Right. You know, so it was great. So now when, when, when you're preparing the kiss with the, with the guy, like was it Hardy and a mustache and all that shit? Yeah, that's not easy. And I always said, you know, and I happened to know who the guy played him. I went back with him a long time. I knew him. He's a great New York actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said, you know, let's just do it, get over it, and, you know, let's just do it and get it done. What about the wardrobe? Did they tell you that <laughs> you got to dress like this at the gay bar? Did they oh, no, that that's stuff? the costume. Oh, but, yeah. oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because you always bring a lot of good acting ideas to the role, so that's what I'm thinking. Like, was this the costume? Yeah, they had that all planned, you know, the leather bar and so oh, on. Okay. And, um... After that, did you ever have, like, did, did anybody, like, get offended? Did they come to you be like, oh, F you, you played a gay dude? Like, some people? Who, who, mob guys? Yeah, like, real dudes, the real people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, they, most of them are okay with it. Most of them, uh, one or two, like, I knew that weren't talking to me anymore. They had a problem with it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, it is what it is. So, uh, so some of your friends got offended, or they supported you, like whatever. Not friends, guys that I knew in the neighborhood that you know, that I used to say hello to, talk to, and whatever. They one, they didn't like the mob show, and two, they didn't like that they were there was a gay guy that was a mobster, you know. Right. So who knows? No, I hear you. But then afterwards, it, it was all good, right? People didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did like uh, the gay community reach out to you and say, "Hey, man, that was great. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for." Well, it was it was a poster child for Glad for you know a minute or two, mm -hmm. and then I came out with my own pool stick, uh, a, a cue to die for. You know, and that's how they killed me, right? They beat me and then they stuck right. a pool stick up my ass, and then they had a big problem with it. They got in touch with HBO, and he's glorifying, uh, you know homophobia and so on. I was like, listen, it's just a fucking pool stick. All right, take it easy. Right, right. Joe, you guys, when you guys went to the Emmys, SAG Awards, I mean, were the other TV shows at the after parties were like, oh my God. I mean, you guys, wherever you went, you guys were a hit, right? Well, we were filming in Jersey and there was always a big crowd out. Mm -hmm. They loved uh, seeing us and meeting us and talking to us and uh, Emmy parties. <clears throat> I mean, I think I went to it was one after party. I, I don't even remember it that well. Um, but you know, it was fun. It was fun. It was probably once in a lifetime thing. Hopefully, uh, I'll get to go more. I mean, I just shot a pilot uh, with uh, Kate Bosworth. And uh, it's called Bring on the Dancing Horses. I spent uh, two weeks in Montana shooting it. And uh, it should be, uh, it was the pilot. So it was a really great role. Another gay guy, but you don't get to see him being gay. But I was skeptical at first. But uh, Kate brought me to the director, her husband, and said, this is the guy. You've got to get him. So... It was nice, uh, you know. You know, there's no gay stuff in it, but I, I you know, you'll you'll see it. But it was pretty cool. And you guys shot it when? This past summer? 
Uh, actually, right around Thanksgiving. I had to spend Thanksgiving there, actually. Yeah. They held me over <clears throat> because they wanted to really make sure that it was, you know, we were comfortable. It was big scenes, and uh, she was great. And uh, it was fucking cold, you know, Montana. <laughs> I forgot where I was. Butte. I think it was Butte, Montana. And uh, are you still auditioning right now, Joe? Or people just hand you part? I just auditioned for something. It was terrible. I hate putting myself on tape. Well, that's, I'm a terrible that's how it is right now. Yeah, I'm a terrible auditioner. And it would have been nice. It was for the uh, Pamela Anderson, Tommy Lee. Mm. Uh, would have been a nice uh, role. But I knew I wasn't going to get it. I was, I was fucking horrible. It's all right. Well... What's the average on auditions? Do you have auditions like twice a week or here and there? How's it work for you? Uh, I, I I don't get many auditions. I don't get many auditions. I you know people get in touch with me to do small stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but nothing major. Nothing major. Are you still close with the cast? Any of any guys that you're really close with? No, no, they were all at my wedding. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, we all drifted apart, you know, I do my own thing. I'm in Long Island, some are in Manhattan, some, you know, they're scattered. So can't really get together with, uh, with, with the way you used to. But you guys were tight, right? Like they all came to your wedding. Like how many guests of the Sopranos came to your wedding? Uh, well, you see my, uh, I don't know if it's on my Twitter or Facebook. You see the well, picture. You see the we, picture right now that I talk. put up? See that picture right there? Yeah, no, that's well, that's part of it. But I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, that family shot that I took with me and my wife and the crew, that's like my, uh, not my profile pic, it's the uh, the other picture. It's on my Twitter. Mm. I don't want my Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we were tight while well, we filmed. It was good. You know, we did a lot of things together. Well, when when you were filming with them, who was the guy that you could call and just shoot the shit with and have dinners with? Well, not really. Uh, you know, by that time I was married, I was living in Long Island. Mm. Uh, the guy I'm closest with is John Fury, Gigi, who died on the toilet bowl. Tremendous yeah, actor. Right, yeah. He's a Boston guy. Great uh, sense of humor. How'd you meet your wife, Joe? Did you hit on her or she hit on you? What happened was is that uh, I was in Brooklyn. She's from Long Island. Mm -hmm. And there was a restaurant in my neighborhood. It's very popular Thursday nights. A lot of mobsters hang out. A lot of broads. A lot of regular guys. What year was that? 05. 05, maybe. In Brooklyn, the restaurant? Yeah, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Which one? What's it called? Ario. Oh, I know that. Well, that's on 101 Street, right? 100 Street on 3rd? No. No, no. 101st Street. 101 was my restaurant. That was fourth and 101st. Ariel was 85th and third. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, what was the one right off the Verrazano Bridge? You see the bridge. What? 101. Yeah, that's 101. Me. Oh, the, so that was your That's restaurant. the one I... Yeah, yeah, that's what I started. And then there's a place called Zio's or some shit like that? Zio's was across the street. Okay, okay. I was facing the park, yeah. All right, so you, uh, you had a restaurant, and that's how you, you met her that night at the restaurant, yours? No, no, I met her at Ario. Oh, Ario, okay. Right, that was right after the scene with the uh, security guard that I, uh, you know, the famous scene with my head pops up with the security guard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so everybody started clapping and, you know, staring. And she was right at the bar with her friend waiting to get a table. And my friend said, Joe, this girl's single over here. You should, uh... I said, I'm already, I already, I already looking at her. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had an ex-girlfriend there was there with a guy, so I was trying to get her jealous. And so I started flirting with this girl, and they, we sat next to each other. And seven weeks later, we got engaged. Seven weeks later? Yeah. And then you have a daughter with her too, right? Yep, yep. There you go. You see that picture? Yeah, I saw. She's going to be wow. 12 in, uh, in two months. So, wow, it's amazing how you guys were so close with the cast, and now everybody just faded away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we had, I had a falling out with one or two guys. Well, one guy, really. 
So I don't want so, you to mention. I don't it want happens. You to, I don't want you to mention any names, but were there any guys that were really hard to work with? No, not really. No, it was easy. Yeah, no one was a pain. No one was uh, a jerk off or a douchebag. They were all really good. They were all professional. When you when you were on the show, going to Yankee games, Giants games, I know you loved your sports. Was it like handed to you? Guys are like, yo, I got tickets for you. Hey, I got free food for you. Was it like that for you? I don't it's go normal. to games because, I, yeah, I don't want to. I don't go to games. Too much of a hassle. Mm. I enjoy watching them in my house. Um, I got. I used to get asked all the time. I used to go to Ranger games. I used to go to, you know, it's too much of a hassle to drive there. It's a long day. Right. Traffic. You're miserable in the car if they lose. You know. People drink, they get stupid, so I'm better off staying home. Fuck them. Did you go to the Super Bowl, Joe, against the Patriots? <laughs> no, no, I don't know. I had a big party in my house. I had the news here. Uh, Channel Five was here. It was great. Um, with the, I love. There's a picture of you on your forehead. It says 18 and one for the New England Patriots. Yeah, that, that was at the parade. <laughs> that was at the parade. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That was at the parade. Where were you the day, the night when uh, Norway hit it, it, kicked it far right? Norway. Oh, uh, Norway. Uh, Norway. Um, Norway, right? Is that his last Norwood. Name? Norwood. Okay. Scott Norwood. Okay. Uh, that's the that's the 1990. That's the uh, I watched that game. That was Super Bowl, uh, and then I was I was done. I was moving to L.A. Oh, okay. So this was I was done by then. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, favorite yeah. moment with the Yankees? Uh, you know, as a kid, I mean, the seventies they were terrible. Steinbrenner, they came along, they started getting better, started getting players. Seventy six, they played the Reds. I was devastated. Finally, get to the World Series. They got swept. Seventy seven, they finally won it. That was great. Um, uh, 78 beat the Dodgers. Um, I had the first World Series, but you know, the one the Atlanta Braves and the, the um, uh, what's his name, Jimmy, uh, the King, they call him Jimmy, uh, Laritz, Jim Laritz, right? Hit the home run, that was big. The Girardi triple, I mean, there's been great moments. But 96 was one of, like, your favorites in the 70s and the 96 World Series? In 96, they won a lot of games. What they won? 118, 121? They, no. won, they, had a big, they had a phenomenal year. Atlanta had a phenomenal year. No, yeah, but the Yankees had a you no, know, no, record 96. number of... Uh, oh, no, no. That was uh, 98. 98. Yeah, yeah. But 96 was a good World Series. I mean, they were down 2 nothing, and they're facing, right. you know, three future Hall of Famers back then. The pitcher is that what the Laritz home it turned yeah. it around, right? So he turned it around. Laritz hit that home run in uh, right. game four. They were down six nothing, and then Wallers comes in, throws like 90. Mark Wallers, right? But he left a slider up in the zone, right? Laritz got it, yeah. And Laritz oh, the Bucky it. Den homer was big too. And where were you at that time? The Buck, I was watching in my friend's house. That was the Boston Massacre where we came like 12 and a half games out. Yeah, yeah. We went to Boston, swept them four games, like killed them. They called it the Boston Massacre. Joe, is your favorite football player all time Lawrence Taylor? Oh, yeah. Yeah? And you met him, right? Uh, He did the show. (laughs) He did the the show. show. Oh, okay. Yeah, he did this. Yeah, he did the show. That was my greatest, uh, greatest thing ever on the show. Did you ever have a conversation with him, just shooting the shit? Oh yeah, he was telling stories. He sent his assistant out to get me two signed footballs. Uh, you know, listening to them stories. You know, and this is like, I said, I hear him. I'm doing a shit the Sopranos, and Lawrence Taylor's like sitting across from me. This is like the best thing ever. Wow, LT man. Yeah. Superstar. So now, yeah. 
Now, being a chef, Joe, tell us about what you do exactly. This is this is great. That's how I met you two weeks ago. Tell, tell us what exactly what you do. They could hire you as what? People hire me to come to the house and cook dinner mm -hmm. for a special occasion, birthday. I did one this Saturday. I met you at uh, that one for uh, our pal. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, they're big Soprano fans, the husband, the father, the boyfriend, uh, or it's just a get together. They're all fans. Mm -hmm. They'll ask questions. Uh, I'll tell stories. And I cook, uh, you know, a nice dinner. Antipasta, big antipasta, uh, linguine and clam sauce or a penny alla vodka. And then they could have chicken scarpaiello or um, filet mignon or sea bass or have everything lamb chops whatever they want and that's what i do i'm about there about 10 hours i do the cooking i have an assistant and um i shop i cook and then i leave but it's a long day it's about 10 hours and how do they hire you they have to go through twitter to direct message you yeah they get i mean there's a tri-state restaurant club on uh, facebook mm -hmm. that a lot of people post the pictures and a lot of you know They've heard it, and they keep waiting. You know, maybe the COVID calms down, and so they get Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. <clears throat> they email me. You know, there was been stories written about it, so it's been, it's been great. Well, you know, you were at one of my best friends' home two week two weekends ago. Here they are, oh, Charlie. There they are, and yep. uh, no, they were bragging about good you, people. Man. Good people. Yeah, great people. Yeah, that was that was fun. A lot of fun. You know, here's one thing I want to ask you. You threw out the first pitch at Wrigley Field. What I love about this shot, even though you, you got a Cubs jersey, but you got a Yankee hat right up there too. No, I think that was an old Cubby hat. Oh, is it? That was an old hat? Cubby hat. It looked like a Yankee. Hat. Yeah, it was an old Cubby hat. Mm. No, it was an old uh, an old Cubby hat that they had. And uh, I made sure, you know, I threw from the rubber. I didn't throw uh, in front of the mound. Mm -hmm. uh, and I threw a strike. And, um, yeah, I said, I'm not going to bounce the pitch. I'm not going to throw it wild. I mean, I played ball. So. Well, the, the mechanics right uh, there looks good, right from the side. Look at that. Right on the mound. Yeah. Now, that was, uh, you know, I know how to throw a ball. And I had shoulder surgery, so it was a little, little fugazi. But. Uh, when I got back to the stand, they go, oh, we're all taking bets if you were going to, you know, reach the plate. I said, please. That same weekend, uh, that was sad. I don't know if that was a Friday or a Saturday. And then Sunday, I went to go watch the Blackhawks play the Wings, and they made me shoot the puck. And I was half in the bag between second and third periods. Mm -hmm. And it's on YouTube. Vito shoots the puck. And... um I nailed it from center ice twice. I was on ESPN the next day. You know, for some reason, when there's pressure on you, you don't feel like it's pressure. You know you're going to come through, right? Like, that's how you feel? Well, I knew I was going to get a good shot off. You know what I mean? I didn't know if I was going to nail it. I thought you had to do it once. And then they, they you know, they only have one hole. And, uh, you know, they had three holes where the puck barely fits. And I nailed it twice, uh, which was pretty cool. I, I knew I could shoot a puck, so I wasn't worried about that. And how did you get the Cubs uh, the first pitch? How come the Yankees didn't invite you? I don't know. I don't know. But Chicago is cool because I love Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I think I knew the GM at the time. or I knew someone. Somebody hooked it up. And I went with a few guys. We wanted to go to Chicago to the Cubbies. So that was great. You know, what I'm really impressed during the pandemic, you have an aunt that's 104 years old? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just talking about her. She passed. Um, she got COVID. She was 104. She got out of the hospital, uh, out, out of the nursing home. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a home. And my my cousins were so grateful. I brought them. So what, um, what I did was, <clears throat> during the height of the uh, pandemic, right about this time last year, actually, I started April 9th. <clears throat> and I did it for seven weeks. I raised uh, 30, almost 35000 
and I wanted to help the restaurants in my neighborhood because, you know, I'm a restaurant guy. I bought food from them and I took them to hospitals and nursing homes and police department, fire department, sanitation, post office. And I did breakfasts. I did lunch. I did dinners and I did it, you know, over a hundred pickup and deliveries. So I'd raise the money, then put the order in, then go take it. Wow. But she beat COVID, right? That's that that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, she she got um she had blood poisoning, uh she was lasted, but she didn't die in a home and uh, her family got to see her. And they brought her home and she was so happy. She didn't know why it was like a couple of hundred people there. There she is, my aunt Ida. Mm-hmm. There's a couple hundred people there at the nursing home. And um my cousins were forever grateful that they got to be with their mother, you know, yeah. instead of her dying and never seeing her again in the nursing home. Yeah, wow. Sorry about that. Mm, 104. I you mean, did, you did everything you can, man. I mean, listen, if I could hit the triple 104. digits, uh, yeah. you know, you hit the triple digits, you lived a life, you know. But on top of that, you also uh, beat COVID. That's like, what? <laughs> I'll be happy to get into my 80s, trust me. I hear you. Did you get hip surgery too, Joe? Uh, I had double hip surgery. As soon as they killed me, I went right into the hospital. After the, when you when you were done with the Sopranos, did you, you did like you wrote books, you did commercials. I I did a uh, I wrote a cookbook novel, loosely based on my life. You know, mm-hmm. chef, gambler. It's uh, it's a novel called A Meal to Die For. And uh, now I'm getting ready. Uh, May 24th, I'm going for the uh, bariatric surgery. So which one's that? Uh, but the sleeve, sleeve over the stomach. Oh, I got okay. the band. Yeah, I got the band. And uh, you know, when my hips went, I became so non-active and ate so much. I mean, I just was in bed. I got the band done. That helped. They played that into the show. But now I want to, uh, you know, enough with the uh, – and I play golf. I walk golf. Uh, but now I'm going to uh, make a big move and change the whole everything. Well, yeah. Well, you're doing great. Joe, listen, I know you got to go. Hanging out. I really I appreciate this interview. Thank you for the opportunity, you know. <laughs> Especially oh, my talking. pleasure. Hey, this is Joe Ganascoli, Vito from The Sopranos. How are you? Please subscribe to Eddie Mata's YouTube channel. Bada bing.